Hello, hello, this is Arcades, and welcome to a, uh, well, this originally was supposed to be a tips and tricks video, and after I dove into some stuff, it's now a discussion video. In other words, this is going to be a lot of me talking about stuff I found out. I am going to preface it that is mainly my hypothesis and conjectures about the things I'm about to address in terms of the subject. Which, in the case of today's thing, will be the condensers. Yes, I think I finally understand the problem with the condensers. And it's, it's a tricky situation of they're working as they should, but not as intended. And... Uh, there's there's a number of factors from what from my opinion so like I said this is the discussion this is mainly um, there's a lot of assumptions I'm making with some of the stuff I'm going to present but I'm hoping it might bring enough of a discussion about the subject that maybe it will bring some things to light or give people who probably are a lot better at diving into this stuff than I am able to bring forth say hey this actually might be what needs to be fixed. And, uh, yeah. So, I uh, hope you enjoy what you watch. Hope you like what you see. If you do, remember to like, subscribe, leave a comment. Helps out the channel immensely. And, uh, yeah. Oh, boy. Let's talk about this. Okay. All right. Quick preface. Um, we are going to be talking about condensers. Primarily, I made a video before that talked about um, radiators, and I had put down um, using, um, oh, what was it? Oh, yeah, cooling the steam and using cylinder heads as a way to cool. Now, they're extremely powerful techniques, but after doing some research, uh, yeah. Now, what drove me into this research is there was a comment in that video that I leaned too much onto exploits to fix a solution. And I was like, you know what? The person was right. I should have gave a more normal method of, a more legitimate method of cooling the condensers as an option. So I went to put it in. Now, the main point of that video, and I still state this, was just to basically inform people Radiators suck with cooling and steam if you don't put them properly. They can be used, but, well, when I went to go do that, when I went to go find this extra stuff, I went down a rabbit hole of what the fuck with the system. Yeah, so there's a big mess to really cover with this. Um, so, yeah, my opinion is condensers work as they were designed. They do work as they should. I totally 100% think they are doing what, when you get to the code and look at it, they're doing what they're supposed to. I believe there's a problem with the layering of different systems together that is causing condensers just to go, you know, just, and I don't know if there is a simple solution to this. Mo like I said earlier on, everything I'm going to give is probably going to be considered mostly circumstantial evidence that point in a certain direction, and I don't know necessarily how to correct. And a lot of things people are going to say, well, yeah, you should have known this. This seems obvious. It seems obvious, but not from, you know, not necessarily from the history of this game in my from my perspective. And yeah, so, um, Okay. Let's start over. The, let's let's start over the problem. Problem is, is I saw a lot of comments of people talking about how condensers are broken. And every time I look at these people's creations, they've always had the radiators close. And I went into you know observing stuff early on, even pre, um, pre space DLC update with compressed gases. I worked the shit out of freaking steam. I loved my train. I have multiple steam systems set up you know i have i built back when mr in jersey had his competition for the coal hauler for a particular dock that he um liked that's when i you know when it really started first few steam systems 
And I really wanted to uh, make sure that I got it down and got it working. And at the time, my Steam system worked wonderfully. Now, so I've been running with a lot of Steam systems ever since then, and I've always tried to make sure I had them down pat. And I always did have a configuration that worked. But I know there's times where it was just a working configuration and not a full understanding of Steam. So I took my time to try to actually understand Steam, which is where this original, you know, setup came from. And with all the, you know, temperature sensors, this rig setup and all this, this all came from, you know, that's where, you know, this thing came from. And this has always been my experimental bench for Steam to understand the components and any changes. Now, you know where this system comes from. I'm going to address probably the biggest culprit in the entire system post space DLC. It's the ambient heat. And I think I figured out why, uh, at least, you know, hypothetically, why certain things happen as they did post DLC. So, one of the big things post DLC is we had the firebox getting near them would hurt and damage and kill a player. And, you know, everybody thought this was, you know, was kind of, you know, BS and was saying it. And was wondering why it was taking so long to fix. I think I know why. Because with the with the DLC or with the with the compressed gases, I keep saying the PLC, DLC because it, it's synonymous with the space DLC. The compressed gases update um, added an atmosphere to the world. So pre compressed gases, there you know game wise, game mechanic wise, there was no atmosphere. You know there was no atmosphere. It was just pulling in data probably from the port based on where it was facing. So if it was inside a contained space, it used the data in that space. If it wasn't used, you know, the data that was defaulted, that was the world in the area they were at. So there really was no atmosphere to work with. Well, now they have the data, They add, when they added the compressed gases update, I think they added an actual atmospheric data that the game pulls from for the ports and processes systems. And ambient temperature is one of those systems they added that probably spreads across that atmospheric data. So you now have in the atmospheric data, you have all these, these gases, which would, you know, comprise air. Well, the thing is, is the fluids, it's still technically a fluid and it carries a uh, temperature. So instead of just a non-existent thing there, it actually exists to some degree atmospherically. So what it would do is it heat up the immediate area around the furnaces and cause damage to you because it's there now. You know, because, uh, you know, they had to have these selection of gases available atmospherically. And I think they probably tried to figure out a number of ways to actually get around that, but ended up, I think their ultimate solution was they just turned off the temperature change on the atmospheric values from ambient temperatures of the furnaces. I think every anything, in fact. Uh, I think the only exception might be nuclear, but I haven't tested that. But even then, I still bet that's the case, because we're not focusing on nuclear right now. It's mainly steam. Well, you're like, nuclear is used for steam, but that's only a heat source, not the actual steam production itself. And while it is relevant, it's not exactly specifically relevant. Um, so, well, the other thing is, is that heat was never contained in a space but i've seen exceptions to this and it was those exceptions that led me to believe that they just blatantly turned off you know the temperature data for um for ambient you know for the atmospherics 
Um, I guess to sh show one example of this, give me one second. Okay, so you see here I've got a 1x2 exchanger with nothing on it. I've got a 1x2 exchanger with just ports on it, so that means there's just air connected to each of those. It's stagnant, it's sitting in there, so nothing's going to really happen. <laughs> okay, so, and as you can see, this thing's already kind of warming up. They're trying to get to, you know, 30 degrees because that's what the ambient is here. This one's sitting still. Now we're going to sit here and turn on the furnace. This one right here. And we sit here and watch. you notice they're both going up, right? And right now it looks pretty even, but as you get watching over time, eventually you'll notice something. This one's still staying cool-ish. It is warming up. That's, that's definitely a fact. But this one, significantly faster. is trying to work through this and keeping at the same time around that 30 degrees. Okay, so I'm out here at my O-Rig and just to further uh, expound on this thing, we have the two, we have the same exchanger here all the ports are actually facing outside, but it's within the contained space along with these electric furnaces. And yes, they do radiate. Um, so. <laughs> we turn this system on. And now keep a note that that thing's empty. It has no fluid in it. Yeah, see. Temp, temp. Oil bulk, zero. Distillation tank zero, 30 degrees. Now let's say we just go turn it on. Furnaces are on. Let's see, we are getting up to temperature. But this is not changing temperature at all. So it's inside a contained space, which is heating up, but because the ports are connected to the atmospheric data of the world, it's actually not getting messed with at all. So there, that shows that, you know, <laughs> the container data and what's out there, two different. Most would assume that, but uh, yeah. Oh. And in case anybody is thinking, well, maybe it's the electric furnaces that don't radiate. Went ahead and brought one up, set one up here real quick. You'll see that's already gaining temperature. That's gaining temperature. Okay, so now that I kind of showed you like how the different instances of how like the exchangers could be affected with the by the ambient temperature that's being produced i'm gonna go next stage that i went into when i was trying to figure out how to make a setup to cool the condensers for a new video was i you know the first thing i went to was to the liquid air coolers because i have those on my steam train so i decided to start out with you know like the five by threes and work them up now, as you can see, um, we're getting like five, you know, nearly 600 through. Um, yeah, I could put the larger ones on, but I found out that like by default, it just starts out with 600. So I just use the small ones. Now, the thing is with the setup here, I bypassed the turbine. So I'm getting the full flow 
of these boilers coming straight in. Because I wanted to show that it, like, I wanted a large capacity volume. It would definitely allow you to show, say, hey, I've got 2,000 liters of steam coming through. I'm going to be trying to process 2,000 liters of steam. Because if you have a bigger setup, that's what you can do. Like, my train uses 20 turbines, and they cap out at 60 liters a second each. And 60 times 20, uh, that's, what, 1,800 liters of steam a second that's going to be processed through those turbines and coming through for the back end? So just taking it off, and instead of using this as a restrictor, and it just flows straight through. So that's how I'm doing this setup right now. And as I was sitting here testing it, I was noticing that I was like, it couldn't, it was having a hard time being contained. Like, as you notice, we haven't even got to the steam yet. I'm not even sure why it's taking a while. Oh, yeah, yeah, hang on. Generally, I also test with infinite fuel on because I like having it as hot as possible to test for, you know, the, the biggest stress test possible. So that means this gets really hot. Hotter systems mean you're producing steam faster. The boiler gets hotter, which in my opinion... And I believe I have seen this effect that the hotter the boiler is, the faster it processes the water into steam. But on the side thing, it also makes the steam hotter itself. So when the steam comes into the condenser, it's a lot harder. Now, one solution for that, and I saw somebody say, you can make the boiler cooler or the um, furnace cooler by controlling the air input, but then you can't make enough steam fast enough so for larger systems which use a larger amount of parts it can kind of be detrimental using a cooler furnace so I'm just going balls to the wall with the furnace and the parts so as I was testing these you know air liquid exchangers to see you know since I figured you know, there's a constant temperature. I figured, okay, so that means air liquid exchangers would be a, you know, solid use for it. And so I started experimenting with them and I ended up, you know, using the five by threes and I'm like, this, this works. But I always had like an interesting problem with their temperatures and I couldn't put my finger on it until I was messing with it and sort of this configuration. And, you know, I didn't have enough water in the configuration, so I added, you know, a fluid tank to add more, you know, fresh water. Because otherwise it'd have like four liters a second, and that wouldn't work. And then I'm going to turn this on. And like I said, this is, um, I do have infinite fuel on, so, because I want to max out the temperature of the system, so I can max out the, you know, the steam production, so I can see it run through the system. And one thing I noticed is we don't even have any steam here yet, but yet the system is heating up. Well, it makes sense because of ambient temperature, but even this is at 37, but this thing is cooking at 49. Like, why is this getting so much hotter than this thing is? Now, for me, this is the actual core temperature of the thing. And did you just see that spike? Like, it just spiked up and now it's coming down. Because, oh yeah, because now we actually have steam coming through. And you can see, like, temperature A, that's the air. The fact, you know, it's 30 degrees consistently coming through here. And it's drawing off, like, 16 degrees worth of thing. And it keeps going up. And this keeps going up, too. But what bugged me is that the temperature would start rising through all the tests and all the compounding of parts I was trying. I was, it, I was always come up with the same problem. They would always get up to all the parts, all the exchangers would get up to about the same temperature. And they would all have, they would all be at the same 
temperature B would always be around the same point, but then the and then the air temperature, you know, like you know these guys right here, the second temperature, uh, temperature A, would always be indicative of how well it's pulling heat from the system. And it was bugging me because it was, the numbers were too consistent. Like, if you generally, like, stack these guys up one after another, like, in a series, but not make sure their cooling segments aren't connected. In other words, you know, in this case, the air exchange. So if the air exchange are all independent from each other, generally you will see a step-down decrease. But they were, like... There was no change between the temperature B from part to part to part to part. It was like, even if, even if it was a case of them not being efficient, you would see that efficiency difference. But you were only seeing the difference in temperature A and not temperature B. So, for example, you know, like these would go going through and all the temperature Bs would be showing like 60 degrees you know, 60 degrees and such. And then uh, actually I would have, you know, I had like some on this side going across and they would show, you know, like 65 or something like that. It would hit these at the end, 60, and then would come back to this one and it'd be like 65 again. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? Like this should be cooling it down, not back up because these systems are separate the cooling element is separate, and we know, you know, and it's running at 30 degrees. So it was just sitting there bugging me, and I noticed, like I said, like, the temperature of these were going up before the steam had even reached the system. Like, I can understand when the steam hits here, these start getting hotter. These would start getting hotter, and I'm just like... Why? So, and then I had a small theory craft, and I was like, well, let me test something out. So, what I ended up doing is I disconnected this system from the, um, from the condenser. In this case, I just deleted it and completed the loop. And here's the thing. This is raising in temperature. And I'm like, why? Like, this isn't even raising that far in temperature yet. Those are. And it just bugged me so much. Like, why? What is it that's going on that's causing these things to overheat in this nature? Well, even this isn't even, this has now got the steam going through, and it's not even that bad. But why is this cooking to such an insane degree? So the next thing I came up with is then I decided I was out of interest. I just added a tank of gas to the system. So now it's circulating air through the liquid side. We turn the system back on, let it heat up. Now we notice it is heating up, but it's not getting to some of the insane temperatures that it was getting a moment ago. But as you can see, there's like no thermal variance. Like Whereas before, we saw like a crazy difference in the thermal variance between it. It was like 40 and such. So I was like, all right, so what's the difference? I switched out the fluid for the air or fluid for the gases. Now we swap back and observe again. You'll see, yeah, we're getting that heat up. 
so I came to the conclusion, I was like, well, okay, so maybe it's not specifically the ambient temperature that's actually messing things up, but something about the fluid that the fresh water itself is actually more the culprit than anything else. It's the fact that pretty much any of the parts that run liquid in it, so like the steam condensers, end up absorbing more heat from the ambient than just something that's randomly not. And then it got me thinking is like, well, wait, if that's the case, then is every part susceptible? Not even just the ones that are, you know, have a temperature on there. Because you see this thing's still, like, sitting down here at, like, 23 degrees. Over by this, you know, this box. And over here, I even have this, which is not even running. It's just sitting here. This was for an attest in there, and it just got fresh water in it, spread across it. That thing's already cooking at, like, that temperature. Okay, so then my next thought was, is there a way to isolate the, the system from the ambient heat? Because I saw, you know, because I saw with the test with the oil rig, I was like, hey, this is... That wasn't gaining any heat from there. So I put the, you know, the aired air cooler, or the liquid the air cooler inside this sealed container. And tested it out to see if it would work as well. Maybe it would help save the, uh, the exchanger from getting hit with the ambient heat. Now, I went pretty far, as you can see. I sealed up the steam condensers. And then I also sealed up the actual exchanger, and I got the temperatures here listed there. Which, by the way, I think I'll go ahead and cover this. These three steam condensers you see here, they don't have any ports on them. These were kind of my controls on on ambient temperature so these things are really just soaking up temperature from the thing because without the you know without anything connected on there it seems they do not spawn with any fluid in them so they're literally just taking the ambient temperature in general so as you can see there's no steam in on these yet And temperature B, of course, is just rising out of nowhere. Still no steam yet. We're already up to 43. 46. And this is the rough area. So, you know, blocking in this wasn't an option. So the next step is I decided to block in the furnace itself. So this is all sealed up. I believe yeah, you can see a liquid meter right there showing. It's even it's even surrounded by liquid. And you can see, again, it's still cooking up before this thing has even received any steam. And it's now just starting to receive steam, so... Yeah. And I think, like, the biggest culprit is these parts are getting hit with the ambient heat from here, and it's cooking, you know, it's actually raising the temperature of the fluid inside the system. So it just gets into the exchangers and makes them less potent because they're already superheated by this, 
And then the steam comes in, and it's heated up, and compounding the situation. So you have like two different sources of heat that are just coming in. And just heating up this the cooling system to making it non-functional. Now you're going to also notice I've got this close. I mean, if I was to bring it out here, it would probably work a lot better. But then again, you see, I've got these out here. I've got these all the way out here, and they were failing for the entire system. Like I really did try to bring it out and made distance a thing. And as you can see right here, this is still getting hit with the temperature right here and these are even sitting at 30 degrees for the air temperature okay so here's the compound system I've mentioned a few times uh, it consists of basically I've got uh, an air liquid exchanger there I've got an air liquid exchanger here as well this is the farthest point from the thing and then I got a larger uh, air liquid exchanger right here we've got our control system now how I've got this working because I haven't mentioned this before is I have these variable valves before each of the condensers and then I have a function block that controls the valve basically it monitors the temperature and closes it when this thing hits 80 degrees so that way yeah, you know, it stops the steam coming in and then it causes this to dis allow it gives it time to dissipate the heat out of here. However, these guys don't have the heat dissipation that this does. So these will shut at 50, but they'll keep climbing because, you know, that and the fact there's steam sitting in there, that steam will keep heating this these up. But they'll try their best. Now we go look at some of these temperatures here. You see, temperature B, which is the fluid coming out, is 55, 55, and then 56. And you can tell temperature A, that's the temperature of the air going out of it. So it's pulling like 4 degrees off the system. 4 degrees, and then we got 12, but yet temperature's not really changing out of B. And, you know, it's just one of those cases that the only thing is, that would really show the significance of that is that if the fluid was getting heated up by the ambient temperature in there which makes the you know the exchange process of you know like the of the air exchangers pretty much well makes them pointless uh, at least in my opinion so far so using a system like this is won't wouldn't even help because there's no actual you can see we're got like 69 68 67 yeah once everything i think hits a threshold we might see a more proper you know temperature exchange but because yeah we got 71 71 72 71 and this is a much bigger more change i think it is doing its job the problem is, it's just the ambient temperature is overriding any of the temperature that this is changing. And it's, yeah, you know, 13 degrees drop. 13 degree, or yeah, 13 degrees, 47 minus 30 is 13. So it's, you know, the air is getting heated up by 13 degrees, but, you know, it's not dropping worth of crap. And the system... Just constantly hovering around 80 because of the valve that's locking it. Okay, so this finally brings me up to my last, like, little bit of thing. So I was like, okay, you know what? Screw it. Let's try air-to-air. -air. Actually, I did try an air-to-air -air system earlier. It was a bit of a mess. So I tried something more specifically built. And we're just using a 2x5 here. On the system and as you can see got some air in there we got some flow they're both as you know through all the ports you 
can see we're getting up to heat. And the system's not getting overheated right away. Now it is getting warmed up, but it's not like in the 50s. Like it's generally like really hot by the time the steam hits this. And really hot's like above like 50, and, but you know. Um, let's see, temperature B, let's see. No, temperature A. Okay, temperature A is the condenser. Temperature B is that right there. But as you can see, the system is actually holding temperature. These are not connected. And the air to air does work fine. And this thing is cooking at full temperature. Now, as you see, it is slowly going up, but it's only like every hundredth of a degree. So eventually that will even out and this should lock in place. So as long as there's not another source of increased temperature, it should be fine. Now, one other thing I did um, want to test out on is I had made, uh, I mentioned about cooling the steam. And I really wanted to see how powerful that was. So as you see here, I've got, and I also wanted to test the, the uh, proximity to the furnace being an issue with the ambient temperature of the machines. Now, as you see here, this is 168 degrees. That's the temperature of the steam going through this right now. Now, as you also notice, I don't have any pumps on these ends, but these are connecting to create the other reading. So it is possible that this is dropping that temperature down, but this is at minimum going to be as hot as that, <laughs> as that, you know, being around that will be. So we're looking at 133 right there. Now I have these manual valve controls. so that I can change the flow through here and this part, which is farther away, and as an actual active system. Now temperature A again is the steam, and B is actually these ports right here. Right, A is 855, 859, yeah. So as you can see, the it's the depending on what you use, this could be potent to to very little. This isn't actually that strong. At least at least not in the manner that I have listed here. Probably the uh, larger thing over there would probably have a bigger impact than this thing would, or you know, my example with this thing will be stronger. But yeah. All right, all right. I know this was a long-winded discussion, but I'm going to make this, try to summarize this up a bit. So the main problem I think condensers have is that they are mainly cooled, that their best method of being cooled is having through a liquid interface. And that liquid interface, the fresh water, is getting cooked by the furnace before the steam even shows up to or is getting heated up by the furnace's ambient temperatures before the steam even gets in there. So the so the condensers are already hot in the first place. Just from there. So location is definitely key to the situation. The farther away, the better off you are, but that still doesn't change the fact it's going to be preheated by the fern by the, you know, by your furnace's heat sources. So keep that in mind, and those things especially get hot. Now, yes, in this example, I didn't have steam, I didn't have turbines in the way of the steam to restrict the flow. Turbines will only release at 60 at 60 liters a second. I'm not sure about the pistons. I don't use them a lot, 
I have more experience with the Pistons because I just like how smooth they run generally. Uh, but the thing would still be true. The hotter your, if you have a lot of equipment, generally the hotter you'll want your furnace to run. But if you keep it cooler, it'll keep your steam cooler because your boiler is cooler. Which then will help your your condenser in the thing. And it wouldn't hurt to split the load up between multiple condensers if possible. Try sticking also to, if you have a more extensive setup, try sticking maybe to some air-to-air -air systems. Um, you don't want to get rid of all the, like the liquid. When the condensers spawn, they spawn with fluid in it. It should be fine to use that. From what I can tell, if you try to get rid of the liquid, the thermal capacity is just not there. Like, whatever they did to the ambient temperature of the air in the atmospherics affected, you know, whatever's in the pipes, and it just doesn't work. Like, doesn't work anywhere near as good as fresh water for cooling. However, and, like, even the system you see behind me, the, like I said, the condensers spawn with it, so you have a little bit of fresh water cycling through that section that's connected to the condenser, while the other side is completely air. Um, the atmospherics of the air does not carry temperature. It just sticks to the, the default atmospheric of the area, from what I can tell. This does not mean the parts don't get affected by the temperature, the ambient temperatures and stuff, but, uh, as far as your cooling for air exchange systems, you can pretty much bet to calculate that it's going to be 30 degrees if you're in the desert, 20 if you're up in, you know, Sawyer, or I think it's, what, 5 degrees up in the Arctic? So keep that in mind. Uh, unless they add something in the future to allow us to cool down the things, like, you know, he mentioned cryocoolers in the last dev Q&A. Um, I don't think we're going to see something, anything, you know, major. So, um, so yeah, just like I said, keep that in mind. Your condensers, how close they are, the ambient temperature... The, how much fluid is in the system overall for your cooling will affect it. And, uh, yeah, uh, I think that covers most of it. Proximity doesn't matter as much if the source of the heat for an exchanger pot is harder than the ambient. Because, you know, we had the steam going at like 167 degrees and really it didn't show like it, it was, you know, an issue. That it was even closer far to the firebox so um yeah uh i like i said a lot of this was just me experimenting and it's hypotheticals on my part and i think i noticed why certain things were done like they did by the devs in my opinion so yeah i hope you understand the rambling i hope some of it came through at least give you you know, a thought on how to look at your systems to try to take some of this stuff into account. Because just remember, it seems that fluid and ambient temperature, the fresh water and ambient temperatures, don't like each other. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, hope you had a good time. Hope you enjoyed your watch. If you did, you know the deal, you know the spiel. This is Arcades signing out. Have yourself a good day. Whee!